All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our cyber chip with cybersecurity professionals that we're having this evening. Um, thank you for taking the time to uh, sign up and take this with us. And thank you to, for our panelists uh, for taking part. I'm going to introduce uh, Steve Wu here, which is a scoutmaster of Troop 4201 and assistant scoutmaster to Troop 37. Uh, he's done a great job putting this together and uh, making contact with our panelists to make this possible. So, Steve, I'm going to throw it to you. Thank you, Mr. Wilms, and good evening, Scouts. It's so great to have you here today. I'm going to be uh, talking a little bit about cybersecurity this evening with our great speakers, whom I'll introduce shortly. But understand this is uh, some, a beginning part of your cyberchip program. So you will go back to your, your troops and follow up to actually get the award itself. What we're doing is just giving part one of your cyber chip program and then you could do whatever else that your troop is doing in order to finish the the program so in our troop for example we have scouts uh first class scouts lead small group discussions about what this what you heard during this program or you know when if somebody gives a talk and then sharing experiences about cyber security cyber safety and cyber bullying and good citizenship using um, the, your devices in the internet so uh, this is just part one. We're not taking attendance, but uh, please let your scoutmaster or you know your senior patrol leader or whoever's uh, working your cyber chip program know that you've attended this program, and then you can follow up. Also, all scouts, uh, please understand that um, as part of the cyber chip program, you should agree on a set of rules of good citizenship and using devices in the internet in your home with your parents or guardian. Uh, and you will be signing a cyber chip contract of some kind. I'm guessing that your, your troop will require that. So all of that will come later and you go back to your senior scout leadership to follow up with uh, the cyber chip program after today. Anyway, um, we have some fantastic speakers that we're going to be sharing today. I'll begin with uh, Sandra Lambert. Mrs. Lambert is CEO of Lambert and Associates. Um, she is one of the founders and a Hall of Fame members, Hall of Fame, one of the Hall of Fame members of the Information System Security Association, which is this big trade group of information security professionals. And that's, that's a huge deal. So um, she's one of the, the superstars in the information security field. I'd also like to introduce uh, Michael McAlpin, who's been an information security officer, now retired from a unified communication system telephony and uh, call center support, a uh, company called 8x8. Uh, and, and Michael McAlpin has been kind enough to join us today from his fishing trip. So you'll see he's in his car today. And we're so grateful to have Mrs. Lambert and Mr. McAlpin today. And then we will uh, uh, have the last part of our program uh, with Peter Andrada. And Mr. Andrada is a, um, works for a company called Junio doing um, uh, he's a senior technical, uh, senior director of uh, information technology at Ju Jumio Corporation. Um, and and I, I met Mr. Andrada because he gave a presentation on cybersecurity with, um, at Los Altos High School some years ago. And he was so engaging and he had, he had everybody's attention in, in, in school that um, I said, anytime we're doing a cyber chip program, I really want to take that spirit from Peter, if not actually having Mr. Andrada there himself. So we have... Mr. Andrada himself today. So uh, we'll be closing off the end of the program with the cyber chip topics that you really need to, to know. But I'm guessing that you've been doing cyber chip for uh, uh, many years. Um, you may have taken it as uh, a beginning scout and maybe you're first class now, um, or um, maybe you, uh, you, you just want to recharge your, your cyber chip award. And I realized that a lot of the cyber chip topics are don't change from year to year for, you know we do it twice a year in our troop and i i don't want to have to cover the same topics over and over again and so i wanted to change things up and at the same time you have to understand cybersecurity is a really important thing in our country and in our world right now it's going to make a difference in your lives because if something goes wrong with cybersecurity it can shut down your life and we had a recent example of that. I don't know if you've been watching the news, but there's a company called Colonial Pipeline in the East where they got hit by an attack, a cybersecurity attack, 
And actually these bad people held the company up for ransom and said, you need to pay us some money or else we won't give you your data back. And they, they made their data such that they, the colonial pipeline folks couldn't get at it. And literally people were running out of gas in the East Coast, like Virginia and North Carolina. Imagine going to the gas station and you couldn't pump it because of something that happened because of a cyber attack. You, you wouldn't think necessarily that this is uh, with computers and stuff that it could really affect something like pumping gas, but it can. And there might be other uh, examples that we'll talk about later on today. And there was even an example of a woman who apparently died in Europe because there was a, an attack against the hospital and the hospital wasn't able to bring up the medical records or I don't know the details, but basically an attack uh, through through uh, cyberspace ended up killing this woman because the hospital couldn't support her, uh, didn't have access to data. So it, it's a big deal. It's, it's going to become more and more a life and death kind of thing. And with, and that just shows you how important this, this career is. And so what I thought is adding a little bit of information about what cybersecurity is about as a career might make this a different program from what you've usually covered in your troop and it can open your eyes to the opportunities. And I'm thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking for Mrs. Lambert and Mr. McAlpin, this is a big opportunity for scouts in the future if you go into a career in cybersecurity. And not only that, but one of the points of the scout law is a scout is helpful. One of the things that I admire about Mrs. Lambert and Mr. McAlpin, and they will tell you, they help people. They help people prevent the kind of problems that I was just talking about. And that gives them such great satisfaction for all the help that they've given to the people that they've worked for and the companies that they've worked for. It's made a huge difference to those companies and you could have that career opportunity too. So um, I, I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to um, Mrs. Lambert and Mr. McAlpin. And I just wanted to ask, do you have anything to add about uh, my comments about how important cybersecurity is to our nation and our world? Sandra, do you want to go first? Sure. Well, Stephen mentioned a couple of examples I was just going to mention. So you can see we're all on the same wavelength here, which is good. It's like the Vulcan mind meld. We're all in the same boat. Um, oftentimes in the past, we thought that hackers were just kids sitting in a room you know, eating pizza and screwing up people's operating systems uh, that run their computers and everything. But the problem now is that it's gotten to the point where nation states, so countries that are not friendly with us, uh, like Russia or maybe North Korea or countries who don't have the same vision of democracy that we have, they're the ones who are now supporting hacking. And they're the ones who attack our critical uh, supply chains, like gasoline. I mean, how are you going to get to your soccer match if your mom has no gas to, you know, put in the car to take you there, or the bus can't get you there because they run on gas? Um, if if it hits the power grid, you're not going to be able to use anything once the battery dies. You won't be able to charge your iPhone or your iPad or your laptop. Uh, because there's no power. We'll be sitting, you know, with flashlights and candles uh, in our homes. So um, it's really critical for our, our future and our comfortable life that we are used to uh, living here, that cybersecurity is paramount in the minds of uh, individuals at home, like your parents and you, so that you don't get uh, cyber bullied or or scammed such that you end up in a dangerous situation with some person who says they're somebody that they're not really and and their intent is really to harm you rather than to help you. So all of these things play into you having a happy life and being able to do what you want to do with your life. That's how important cybersecurity is to me. So I might add, uh, Sandra, uh, First of all, Stephen mentioned hospitals uh, who were victims of uh, uh, phishing and other types of attacks. Uh, about two years ago, two hospitals in the Northwest were shut down and uh, emergency services couldn't, couldn't use them. 
people's uh, people died. So that's one other area. The other one is that in, a, in addition to what Sandra mentioned, there are attacks against your, your home finances. So your parents could find themselves in a place it could even possibly be something that you did innocently that helped this happen, uh, whereby they uh, they lost their 401k or they they became uh, in, in a position where they couldn't could no longer support you in the custom in the style you're accustomed to. So uh, more and more, I think Sandra would agree, especially with the major you know, China, North Korea, and others, uh, hostile state governments, uh, some in the Middle East, um, pointedly attacking critical services in the U.S., uh, there can be um, very interesting results. And it used to be, I think Sandra would agree, that they mostly attack companies, but now they're also attacking uh, interesting uh, um, personal uh, situation. So your, uh, your parents' uh, finances, for instance. So uh, I personally, at least, feel this is incredibly important. Yeah, it, it, it's worth mentioning, too, that um, Mr. McAlpin and Mrs. Lambert mentioned um, countries that are attacking us or, or organizations that are sponsored by countries, but there's also organized crime. In other words, uh, criminals are looking for ways of using cyber attacks to steal money or to steal other things, information that can be turned into money. And that, that might mean that if your parents lost a credit card, that that credit card stolen number could be used to make purchases that they didn't approve. And so they, they end up losing that money and they're, they're, they're charged that by the, the credit card company. And they, yeah, they can actually tell their credit card company, hey, this is, this is not a, a, a charge that's okay with our family. This is actually fraud. Um, but if they don't catch it, then your parents end up paying for that. And then your parents are actually paying for it indirectly because they have to pay higher rates, um, higher prices to the merchants because the merchants have to pay more to the credit card companies because some percentage of that is covering the fraud. Um, so let, let's change subjects here and ask Mr. McAlpin and Mrs. Lambert, um, what do you do day to day at work? What's your day like? Oh, so Sandra, do you want me to lead this time? Yeah, your turn. You get to go first, Mike. <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, Sandra, I remember you from the various uh, meetings at ISSA. Uh, Sandra is, uh, is indeed an important person. I'm glad you're able to be here. Um, so what's a day like? Um, so, so the really important thing, I think, is that you're needed. You know how, how sometimes you feel important because you don't feel like you're making a difference? Like who would care if you weren't there? When you're, when you're a critical component of making a company able to run its operations every day and close sales by uh, assuring their customers that they're secure, and keeping your your home finances intact, um, that's a big deal. Um, there's in, in every, well, let me give you an example. Um, as I would walk down the hall, I got nothing but smiles, right? The CEO of the company would give me a high five. That doesn't happen in a lot of cases, right? You really genuinely are helping the company you're working for and the individuals that you interact with. So we would do classes for the employees. And I can tell you for sure that we, we saved uh, at least two that I can think of from, from severe financial crises. So believe me, you are going to be appreciated and you are going to make a difference. And by the way, you're often uh, remunerated uh, quite well as a result. Over to you, sir. What's, what's that mean, Mike? Remunerated. What's that mean? Oh, I get you. You make a good salary. Get a lot of money. <laughs> but uh, you know, so one of the things that Mr. McAlpin had been doing is actually holding classes 
for beginning employees of the company, similar to what Mr. Andrada and I are going to be going over today. Mm -hmm. So that's that's part of the job. And um, uh, Ms. Lambert, do you want to talk a little bit about maybe some of the things that you do day to day? Sure. Um, well, it's kind of like being in school in a way. So I'm sure that uh, our audience can appreciate when I first get up, I start checking my, well, after I've had a good breakfast, drank lots of water, all that kind of good, healthy stuff, you know, you got to keep your body healthy to keep your brain going. So uh, I check my email to see if there's any crises, anything, you know, that I need to know. Uh, and after that, you sort of look toward what your projects are, your most important projects, you know, your goals. So in your case, you know, if you have a, a history paper to write and it's due two days from now, you might want to start working on that. So same with us. Uh, we look at what projects we have. It might be implementing a piece of software that will uh, control access to the company's data or to my own data at home here. Uh, or it might be installing a piece of hardware, maybe uh, backup and recovery is so important these days. Um, Mike and, and actually Stephen also mentioned ransomware. Uh, the bad guys, you know, hold your data from you by scrambling it up and they won't give it back to you unless you pay them money. And we're talking big money. We're talking millions of dollars. With a, with a large company. So part of what we do is to do uh, backup and recovery. How, how can I get along if I don't have my data? How can I recover from that? So if that's one of my projects, then I know I need to be working on that. Uh, so, and after that, there are, of course, it seems like in our profession, I would say we have lots of spontaneous events, things that you weren't <laughs> expecting. Um, and there's such a wide variety of topics in our profession, which is one of the reasons I love it, is because my day is never the same. I, I don't go to work and put, um, you know, this widget into this hole, and that's the same every day, you know, every week, every month, every year. Uh, my day, part of it might be disaster recovery, part of it might be access control, part of it might be uh, security awareness and giving training to the employees so that they know how to protect themselves as well as their company. And so there's so much variety. Uh, I am just totally passionate about our profession, honestly. And uh, I, I got into it because because it's okay if I kind of merge into how I got into yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because as a child, I enjoyed games. I like to play games, card games, board games, whatever. I like um, puzzles, jigsaw puzzles, riddles, things of that sort. Uh, I like mystery shows, you know, who done it? Uh, was it the butler with the candlestick in the living room that, you know, killed the guy? Um, and our profession, I think, is a lot like that. We're there to figure out who did it when something goes wrong or how we can put in things to prevent things from going wrong. And uh, the variety, there are so many aspects. You can have very technical aspects. If you like to be a coder, then you take that track and you do coding and you write wonderful pieces of software with security built into them. If you like the management style track, then you can go that way. Um, so there's many different aspects, which gives us a lot of variety. And for me, it makes my day not boring. Yeah, and uh, Scouts, just so you know, I'm actually par part of the information security profession myself, although I don't do it quite the way that Mrs. Lambert and Mr. McAlpin do it, which is I'm a practicing lawyer I'm a, an owner of the, uh, one of the owners at the, a law firm called Silicon Valley Law Group. And, and a lot of my work has to do with cybersecurity. And I've written a bunch of books on it and uh, have been involved in the American Bar Association groups on information security. Um, but day to day, what I'm doing is sometimes I'm negotiating contracts so that a company can sell its products or services. And the customer says, how do I know you're secure? And so, uh, I'm sure Mrs. Lambert and certainly Mr. McAlpin have sometimes had to work in trying to tell customers of the companies that they're working for, yes, we're secure and here's why. 
um, and it gets written down on a piece of a document that, uh, that makes that company commit to some security requirements. The second piece that I do is sometimes I have to um, help companies learn how to comply with the laws that talk about being safe and secure with information. Um, third piece is I sometimes have work on lawsuits that have to do with um, security related uh, disputes that have to do with uh, secure security related things. And the fourth piece is sometimes some, something bad happens. And, and all, uh, Mrs. Lambert and Mr. McAlpin and I have all been involved in incidents where you would say something is called a security breach where some violation has occurred or some bad person has done something that has affected the organization. And then you have to try to respond to that. So we've been involved in trying to make things better. And then the final piece is we try to have our employers uh, do things to manage their security well. And often that means writing documents that tell people, hey, when you're in this situation, this is what you do. Or here's our, our practice of what we do to try to address these kinds of uh, security problems that might come up, some threats that might come up. So that's writing po policies and procedures. So uh, Mrs. Lambert is absolutely correct. You have to know a lot of things when you're an information security professional. Some of it has to do with how does this building set up so that people can't just walk in off the street and grab a computer and, and walk away? Um, and yes. you have to lock up devices and know what devices you have. And, and one of the big things that Mr. Andrada and I are gonna talk about is how you make sure you don't lose your device. You know, somebody could take it from you and you wanna make sure that somebody physically is not taking these things from you. Or let's say that you have thumb drives. Everybody uses thumb drives or USB drives. How do you make sure you don't lose track of them because that might have some valuable information. So there are a lot of things about buildings and how the building and office is set up so that people can't steal information. But then there's the stuff about people. And I was saying that Mr. McAlpin is teaching people about cybersecurity and Mrs. Lambert was saying that she does these classes too. So there's a people part of this to make sure that people hold up their part of uh, being involved and everybody's responsible for security, everybody. So people have to learn how to do that. And, and scouts, you're learning this tonight. You're, you're, you're seeing what the kinds of stuff that Mr. McAlpin and Mrs. Lambert used to teach and in, in, uh, in are teaching. And then there's a part that's about technology. And so try, uh, um, we talk about requirements, uh, I talk about requirements, what you have to do to, to uh, have these technical things like software and hardware put in the proper place. But day to day, Mrs. Lambert and Mr. McAlpin uh, were and are implementing that software and hardware, making sure that it works, that they buy it, they buy the right stuff and they put it into place in their organizations. So that kind of gives you a little bit of, of taste of, of what they're doing. Um, but I, you know, just so some of the unusual things to, to have to know about buildings and construction and where to place terminals and how to prevent theft and uh, you, and how to work with people and what they need to know and how to manage security and then all the technology that they have to know. You see that they have to learn a lot of different things about about their job. Um, and so, you know, along those lines, uh, Ms. McAlpin and Ms. Lambert, what what did you have to? Uh, how did you educate yourself on this and and what if scouts are thinking about doing this what education do they need to be in the cybersecurity profession so i went first last time sandra oh okay all right well um i think that you need to have at a minimum uh a two-year college degree an associate's degree because employers are looking for that and the one great thing about this field is that there are like a quarter of a million, and I'm not exaggerating, quarter of a million openings for cybersecurity professionals that aren't being filled because there aren't enough people there. It's like there's the demand for us, but there's not enough supply. So whenever you finish college, you're guaranteed a job basically in this field. That's for sure. So I'd say at least a two-year degree and um, a four-year degree is perhaps even more um, uh, desirable if you want to go on and, and do other things within the field. It's just like any field, you know, the more education you have, the better. Um, ISSA- so If I could interrupt for just a second. So you're talking about maybe like majoring in computer science or uh, computer engineering? Yeah, it's, well, it's, I'm glad you said that. 
yes, there's a number of different majors because lots of schools who have degrees call them different things. So some of them it's computer science, some of them they call it risk management, uh, others they call it uh, information assurance. Uh, Peter can probably you know, go on about some of the other uh, names that we have, uh, but you want to get into a field that's related to security. So um, I came from the audit background. I was an IT auditor and they're also looking for what happened, you know, how can we prevent that, stuff like that. So I came from that side. A lot of people come from the IT side, whether it be network people, uh, who you know deal with putting up networks for companies and and for the government, or whether they're coders who do programming for things. So there's many different uh, areas, and all of those are good depending on what your interests are. So again, you can kind of pick and choose within cybersecurity what uh, area you want to go in. Yeah, and and just scouts, just so you know, when, when Mrs. Lambert is talking about audit, that is checking up to make sure that a company is doing what it says it's doing and looking at evidence that they, they're actually doing what they say they do. And you can have audits of their finances, but you can also have audits of their information security. Uh, and time is running a little bit short. So I'm, I'm gonna move on to the next question and just say, uh, talk to Mr. McAlpin, um, why did you choose a security related career and do you think it's been worth it? Yes, uh, when I was at Visa, I, I realized I, when I first walked into Visa, they actually showed what was going on with hostile state governments. This is many years ago, and it really was intriguing. And I was very fortunate to have uh, some great mentors there that really got me intrigued. As Sandra has mentioned, and Steve, there's so much going on in that world. If you if you like being challenged a little bit and learning. There's, I think Sandra and Steve would agree, there's room for learning every day. And the really good thing for you guys is that there's any number of funded scholarships from, you know, from Cyber Command and DC to FBI to private organizations, Sandra's organization, ISSA. You see how nice a lady she is. There's a lot of really nice people there that'll help you in your career. Um, it's, it's, it's a real pleasant thing to do to, and one of the things I'd like to emphasize, Steve, is one of the things that I emphasize in the people I, I mentor is that it's, it's what you know. It's not how good an athlete you are or how great physically you are or anything else. It's what you know that will help you be a success in life. And in this area, there is, as Senator mentioned, there's so much of a demand for people that know. Even if you start by knowing just a little, you, you will be mentored. There's so many groups that'll do that for you and give you a jump start. For instance, we have one group in the Bay Area that funds your, uh, your four-year school. And, and during that time, they also have study programs with Oracle and other big companies and everywhere. And by the time you get out, you're already a senior manager making good money. Nice. I and guess Mr. I'd have Lambert. to say that not only was it intriguing, but it looked like an easy path. <laughs> okay. And Mrs. Lambert, uh, why did you choose security and has it been worth it? Well, it's definitely been worth it. I, I'm still as excited about it as ever. I'm uh, sort of moving towards semi-retirement, which means I kind of work when I want to work. And then when I don't feel like working, I don't. Um, but I just can't give it up because it's part of the excitement of my life. You know, it makes me feel like I'm using my brain a, a long time and uh, which is healthy and, and worthwhile. And I feel like I'm helping people because you've mentioned that before, Steve. And um, that's really uh, a big part of it is that you're helping your family, your friends, the companies you work for, the public in general, you're helping them by keeping all of us safe. It's sort of like a vaccine in a way, uh, security work. It's like you're trying to help people, you know, and uh, they talk about in the news, the supply chain, which really just means how you get something from one place to the next or uh, either physically or digitally. Um, and so when you 
are doing that, you might think, oh, I only have to do with, you know, such and such for the, uh, the electrical system. But you, what you do is magnified as it goes down the line. And so you might, you're helping people that you don't even know besides, you know, making it personally rewarding yourself. Every company has to buy things as well as sell things. So whatever it's buying that somebody else is selling it and maybe they're reliable and maybe they're not. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That's true. You don't want to buy something and then you give them the money and you don't get anything in return. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of counterfeiting, for example, that means something fake, you know, even like computer chips, a lot of fake computer chips or even worse. There's some nation states that are trying to get bad software into these, uh, into these computer chips so that they end up being able to break into systems that are using those chips. Um, so, well, we're at the top of the, the hour and I just wanna thank Mr. McAlpin and Mrs. Lambert for their part of the program. And uh, um, Mrs. Lambert's going to hang around and answer questions when we're done with Mr. Andrada, but um, we'll, we'll say goodbye to Mr. McAlpin. Um, he's off fishing in honor of his fishing. I have my neckerchief slide that, <laughs> that has a fish on it. Um, and we're going to be talking about fishing, another kind of fishing with Mr. Andrade as well. But uh, let's, let's uh, thank Mr. McAlpin for, uh, for coming today. And, and thank you so much. And, and uh, uh, we'll talk to you some other time, Mr. McAlpin. OK. And any of you who decide to go with this career, you can contact Steve, who will get in touch with Sandra or, or I. And we will make sure that there are people here who would love to help you are connected with you. Yeah. And Mr. Wilms can also um, take your email and forward it on to one of us as well. Very well. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah. See you. Bye, Mike. Bye bye. Um, now we're uh, we're going to turn to Mr. Andrada and we're going to talk about some of the the things that we normally talk about in a cyber chip program. Now that we heard a little bit about what the profession is all about, we need to know as scouts, what, uh, how to protect ourselves, um, how to prevent losses of information. And I just wonder, uh, first, Mr. Andrada, when you're talking with students, what are students really worried about in terms of threats to their data or their systems or their networks? Well, thank you, Ms. Fru. I, I would like to start off by saying, uh, is Mr. Mike McAlpine, I mean, he had, he had sunglasses on, we didn't know where he was. Was that really a Mr. McAlpine or was that somebody else? That's a little bit about the security side of it. He had sunglasses on. And did we, did we really talk to the right person? Did you confirm that? I'm just, so yeah, I'll, let me answer your question. I would say, um, hello everybody. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here, big opportunity. I'm so grateful. Um, to answer the question directly, what are, what are students or those I speak to concerned about I would say it's things more so like reputation at school, messages that get posted about them, or those who would misrepresent cyberbullying. Those type of things are immediate within the community that you know you guys are a part of, you scouts are a part of. So it's something where you can help others, right? Always look to the helpers. That's the term there. Always look to the helpers. And if you notice a fellow scout or a fellow student or a friend who's down about something. You can always ask, hey, are you okay? Are you doing all right? And if it is a topic that regard in re revolves around social media, whether it's Snapchat, TikTok, any of the other, you know, types of things that, you know, get used by students every day, um, some, most of it is done safely, some is not. You can always ask and be a helper and say, hey, you know, what's going on with you? If somebody you guys know online, um, I mean, I'll just say that I, you know, I have a, a Discord account. My daughter has Discord. You can tell when you're chatting with somebody, hey, how you doing? How have you been? And they're silent or sullen. You can take those cues, those psychological cues, and offer some help. There are other, there are other ways to get people um, help with cyberbullying, and we can talk about that in a little bit. Well, let's talk about some specific threats to security of 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 scouts, devices, sure. and networks. And you know, one of the things that I, I'm worried about is lost or stolen devices. Mm -hmm. You may have a, a, a mobile phone, you may have a laptop, 
as a scout, you may have a, a tablet computer. Is losing the computer a big thing, a big threat? Yep. It, it will, it, it can be if you don't live by the principle that two is one and one is none. And what I mean by that is if you have a phone and you have it backed up and you have the information backed up right to the cloud or to your you know, provider's account, then you have that data, those pictures stored somewhere else. Your phone is stolen. You can work with, you know, you can go to the Verizon store and work with them to send that command to wipe that or log into your your um, iPhone account, right, via browser, and send that wipe command at a distance. What that means is whoever has that hardware just has hardware. Okay? And then you get a new phone and pull that back up down from the cloud or down from iCloud, right? And then you have your phone, your, your backup and running. The idea of having backups is key. So having your data in two places because two is one and one is none. Yeah, it's... It's also the case, imagine that you, you had a paper that you had to do and you put in all of this effort to get your paper yeah. done and then all of a sudden your laptop is stolen and you didn't have a backup. That means right. you have to start all over again and that's a big, big disaster. You don't want to have to be in that situation. And, you don't want to lose and, your data. And to give you an idea, you know, the company I work for, Jumio, is an identity verification and um, I travel all over world. And for example, when I travel, I don't bring this phone, which is my main phone. I bring this phone. Phone. They look very similar, but one phone is what I use when I'm in the United States. The other phone is completely, well, nearly blank. And it's what I take internationally because I don't want to have any personal information on a phone that I'm carrying once I leave American airspace. It can be stolen from me. It can be taken. It can be pocketed or lifted, or any company, a country I'm passing through could confiscate the phone for whatever reason because I'm in another nation. So I bring a burner phone with me instead of my main phone. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Scouts, just so you know, when I do this program for our, our troop, I show a video of a young man who's sitting in a coffee shop. And another young man walks into the coffee shop, walks up to the cash registers, kind of glancing over his shoulder at the mm -hmm. first one. And then when that first one isn't paying attention, that second young man grabs that first young man's mobile phone and runs out the door. I mean, it can be something really like that where your device could be stolen. Yeah. But you don't wanna yeah. you don't wanna lose it like that. And you don't wanna leave it like in a pocket of an airplane or um, or leave it in a car that's visible because people will break into your car and take it. And, and, and another place that would be common is, let's say you're with your parents at Costco and you're rolling through in the cart, your, your mom has a purse in the cart and the phone is visible inside that. It's nothing to have one person you know, distract the two of you and you look left and somebody comes in from the right and swipes the phone right out of the cart. Um, that happens every day. So yeah. all about having your data backed up somewhere else. Now, when you know we heard about ransomware, that's the same thing. If somebody were to come to me on this personal laptop that I use and say, ha, we've encrypted your data on the hard drive and we want you to pay 500 euros to get it back. Number one, I'm not going to reply. Number two, I'm going to report it to the police. And number three, I'm just going to wipe my own laptop, reinstall it from the original operating system and pull my data back down from any number of backups. That I can. So yeah. one is none. And when we're talking about ransomware, we're talking about a, a a form of bad software that gets on your system that an attacker has put on it. Um, but, you know, we're talking also about how does it get onto your computer in the first place? And I'll, 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 I'll again mention that I've got this uh, fish that is a, that my, my neckerchief slide is a fish, uh, but there's something called phishing in mm -hmm. information security that's not phishing like F, you know, with the pole that like Mr. McAlpin was doing, but phishing with a PH. And what is that, Mr. Andrade? So I just put it there in the chat. It's a P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G, phishing, okay? And what that means is when I look at my inbox, my email inbox, I'll have any number of, you know, emails, Amazon orders, correspondence, whatnot, emails back and forth. But I'll also have a few in there where they're saying, hey, there's a problem with your account. And they'll have a link or a button or something to click on. Or attachment. 
right I don't, it could be an attachment could be code that's already in the email itself if i'm reading it html right the way the email's read by the browser and i scroll my mouse arrow over that button and now on my system it gives me a, a warning right it says you know, not a safe link that type of thing but you can tell when the email address that's sending to you is the domain say company.com and you roll over the button in the body of the email and it says something else a long series of some other domain or pointing to some other company or pointing to what the experts were talking about earlier nation states criminal activities and that kind of things so that's the idea is being aware right security is done in layers you lock your house your parents lock their car right it's the same thing security is done in layers so when somebody's trying to fish you they're trying to you know if you can imagine they're trying to cast either a wide net to grab a whole bunch of people or a single line and they're trying to hook you don't get hooked don't don't be a fish right yeah and uh there there are other things that that uh, people need to watch out for um let's talk about security software that that uh, maybe parents put on your computer to help protect your your systems um what's all that about sure yeah no problem so you know you have laptop hardware and what's running on that is the operating system now i would say i would advocate and i would ask uh to, to also give her perspective as a security consultant but the most important thing in my perspective is if i run windows 10 i should keep the windows 10 up to date now it'll tell you when hey i need to pull a download let's you know, let's update this and install and reboot. Follow those guidelines that Windows advises. It's the same with the Mac operating system, the Mac OS. There is there are latest versions of the Mac OS, and keeping those up to date to the latest versions is very important. That's really how a lot of the the cyber defense is done for your individual computer. Now you may see that also for an iPhone or Android, and I would also suggest when you get a message from the manufacturer or whoever has your operating system. When you get that note on the iPhone, my suggestion is that you do go ahead and when the battery's full and plugged in, you go ahead and do that update. What about antivirus software um, for, for PC? Yeah. And, and I would say to that, people have their own preference on what company they go with or not. Now, in my career, I've worked for McAfee, I've worked for Intel, Intel Security, and for FireEye. Those are all definite companies that do cybersecurity. They offer a, a suite of products that would try to protect your computer and your networks. I am agnostic. Uh, for myself, I have a Windows 10 machine. Now, I bought it from Costco. I'm just going to give you the real deal, what happened here. I bought it from Costco, and it came for, with 12 months free of McAfee, a company I worked at for 16 years. Sure, I signed up for 12 months. Now, when that 12 months was over, what I did is... I just use the built-in Windows Defender because I've gone out to experts like Sandra and I've asked, hey, is the native Microsoft antivirus enough? And they say, yes, if you keep your operating system patched, I said just a second ago, and you keep your antivirus up to date. Now, if you if your parents and, and those you know adults in your life, they they have a preference to Norton or Symantec or Trend Micro or any of these other security companies, those antivirus software to install in the machine, all good. Those are all well, you know, well respected companies. I don't have a preference. I just happened to use my 12 months free that came with the Costco purchase. And then I just switched over to, to Windows Defender. That's what I did. Okay. So we talked about keeping software updated. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about uh, maybe ranging with backups. We talked about with backups. So you probably need your parents' help for that, your guardian's help with that. Um, your parents can help you also about encrypting the information, meaning scramble it so that anybody stealing your laptop, um, look it off and not uh, open, so to speak, um, wouldn't be able to get at any of your data. And that's stuff your parents can help you with. Um, but also wanted to talk to Mr. Andrade about password protection. Should I have a password on my phone and laptop? Absolutely. So the idea here is you want to have um, a way to protect. You want, again, I said security is in layers. One of those layers is pins, passcodes, and passphrases. So um, I'll give you an example. There's something out there in the security world called a daisy chain attack. And what that means is if my password to my Gmail 
is the same as my password to log into the laptop, which is the same as my Amazon password. If a, a criminal, you know, a criminal actor guesses my password or by say social cues or knowing my dog's name plus a combination of numbers, that type of thing, or what they call brute force the password. That is they run the password through a piece of software where it's trying to guess the letters and numbers over and over and over in a room day and night, right? Okay, so if that one password, which is the same across all systems, if that's the same, access in one, you know that when they get a beachhead, when they establish a, you know access, they're going to try every other account that I have. They're going to try my Bank of America account. They're going to try, you know, like I said, Amazon. Maybe I have a Target.com account. They're going to try. They're going to try the entire range of accounts that are available. Uh, TikTok, Snapchat. They're going to try all those passwords as is possible against either my email address or my username. And they're going to get in if my passwords are all the same. So I would say to present, to break the chain, break the chain, the daisy chain attack, break the chain by having different passwords for different systems. Now, we all have multiple, multiple accounts. You might have a Steam account. You might have um, Discord, TikTok. You might have all of this array of applications and access. You can manage those with a password manager. Those are very powerful. What you'd do is you'd have one complex password that would be connected to multiple accounts at once. That's a secure way to do it and have a parent or guardian help you with that. And, and another thing, uh, we'll take questions in, in a little bit. Um, yep. But um, one of the things, uh, you, if you give away your old computer because you're buying a new one, what should you do with that old computer? So, I have a great story about that. We, um, we actually, uh, I'm trying to remember the old, um, uh, the old original uh, NES or uh, uh, the DES, the handheld player. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? And the, the, you guys get in the sense that you know what I'm talking about. Well, there was one that from an older, my kids are in high school now, and my daughter inadvertently dropped hers in a fountain, and we wanted to buy a new one because she still had, I mean, I'll, yeah, I even have them here, like on the desk here. Oh, these are Nintendo Switch games. But anyway, um, we ordered one from, from eBay, and here's what was fascinating. We received that little, you know, game system, and in booting it up for the first time, we realized that there were photos on that because you could take pictures even from the handheld game player. And we scrolled through this person's photos. Now they were, you know, they were harmless. They were of their house and, you know, you know, the, the, uh, the sister playing or whatever, but they hadn't, what they hadn't done and what Mr. Wu was asking us to do is when you're going to either sell your old hardware or buy new, you want to re-image that back to a factory default. Okay, so what I do, and now remember you guys, here, let me, uh, I'll turn off my, um, my Zoom background uh, so you guys can see a little better. Okay, so now you can see where I'm, okay, so this is my main phone, right? This is the phone when I'm using, that I use when I'm in the United States. This is my burner phone that I take internationally. Every single time I arrive back in the United States airspace, I wipe this with a factory reset because then I know it's clean. I wipe this every time. I wipe it out completely to back the factory install. You can do the same thing with anything you're about to sell. Um, now, back in the day, you know, um, you used to be able to pull hard drives out of laptops, and you would instead put in a new fresh hard drive that had no data or operating system or any history or anything. Nowadays, they're mostly soldered onto the motherboard. So what you want to do is you want to re-image and reinstall that, that hard drive before you sell it. That's an example. And your parent or guardian can help you with that. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but uh, let's turn to another topic, which is uh, cyber safety. And one of the things that Mr. Andrada had talked a lot about when he was at Los Altos High School is this oversharing of personal information. Um, and um, <laughs> the founder of his former employer, McAfee, John McAfee, was actually caught when he was a fugitive because a journalist took a photo of him and mm -hmm. the geolocation longitude and latitude of Mr. McAfee at the time was yeah. embedded in the photo as, as part of the data, the photo. You can't see it on the picture itself, but you could look at the file and be able sure. to look at the data. So, you know, talk a little bit about that oversharing of information, especially on social media. Yeah, absolutely. And, and oversharing is something that we, you know, we might do and, and not even know we're doing that. For example, Instagram or, you know, the app, the 
social media for old people, Facebook, right? Um, none of you guys use that, but you know, for Instagram and other and other things, you might have location services turned on. And what that means is where you take where you take an Insta, right? You post it to your account, and you're you getting likes, and you're enjoying that activity, right? There's there's um, enjoyment there. It may store your date, time, and location inherently in that, and could create a pattern of where you've been and and where you've been and that type of thing. So there are, um, you guys may be familiar with the term APIs. There are connectors between social media and other types of software, which can pull data from an Instagram account that can plot that onto a map and show where you've, from where you uploaded that Instagram photo, which is fun. You're on a trip, that type of thing. But what you're telling people are where you are is you're also telling them where you're not. So there can be an instance where you're out in vacation with the family. And if you have location services turned on and you take a photo, let's say of the Grand Canyon or something like that, that tells folks that you're not at home. Okay. Now who would know that friends of friends, people who can connect you. If you share your posts globally, world symbol in some of the social media, and you're going to want to change that to friends only. Right. Um, so really oversharing, uh, can be, can be an issue. You, you want to reduce the amount of information you share, I'm trying to throw a blanket over the fun. I'm not trying to ruin how fun some of the social media apps are, but there's a way to do it in the middle, which is both safe and still fun. And I want you guys to look for that. And time is getting a little bit short, but, uh, we're going to sure. move on to an important topic, which is cyber bullying. And in, as a, as a second class scout, you will learn the three R's of bullying um, to recognize that there's a problem, to resist, mm -hmm. say stop, or somehow get away from the problem. Or And the third R is reporting the bullying, get the mm -hmm. help that you need from a parent or teacher or the principal of your school or a scout leader. So those are the three R's we talk about with bullying. But Mr. Andrade, could you talk a little bit about cyberbullying? What is cyberbullying? That how's it's different from regular bullying? And what are some of the other tips that you've talked about with students about cyberbullying? Absolutely, thank you, Mr. Ruiz. So cyberbullying is is the type of bullying that is taken from the park or playground into into you know apps um, into cyberspace, basically. So. It can be the form of a, you post something that you thought was fun, and then you get an insult underneath it, right? Well, my stance on people who make a, a negative comment towards me or would say a post to me is, you know, um, your opinion of me is none of my business. That's a simple statement. Your opinion of me is none of my business. Now, I wouldn't reply with that, but that's how I carry myself. Um, I know myself well. I know my friends and family. I'm grateful to know Sandra, Mr. Wu, and, and all of these, you know, fine folks here. Um, and so I'm comfortable and confident in that. Now, when you're a young person, you want to explore new things, meet new people, go new places. You guys are looking into some of you are looking, you know, you're going to go to high school and then you're looking on to college. There'll be opportunities where you need to make a gut judgment call on who you're meeting and who you're befriending. You always know a real friend is going to tell you the truth, but they're also never going to tell you something that uh, that negative force in your life would would tell you okay so bullies might it might be a comment under a photo you share or maybe you make a TikTok and you share that and you get negative comments no need to respond and brush them off now if they're hateful and aggressive and repetitious i'm going to add another r if repeats then definitely you're going to want to um you know let a let a trusted adult a parent trusted adult know and here's the thing I want to tell you guys. If feeling bad about the way someone treats you, if you had done something that was maybe took a toe, like a step over the line of what your parents allowed and you ended up getting cyberbullied, every time you should still go back to your parent or guardian and let them know because the danger and the threat to you and to the family and to your everybody you know from a cyberbully is more important than maybe having crossed a line or done something that was edgy within your family's, you know, rules and rules and standards. So um, that doesn't mean you should go about and doing those things. But what I'm saying is don't ever be afraid to include those trusted adults and guardians in your life. They're, they're there to protect you. They're there to help 
So if you're ever cyberbullied, go ahead and bring them in. Yep, tell them what's going on. Yeah, and, I, and I, what I tell scouts also is that we, we as adults can't help you unless we know that you're having a problem. So you have to tell us. And, and, and that will help relieve the problem for you. Yeah. We'll, we'll help you make it better. My kids can come to me about anything, anytime, for sure. They're open door on any topic, anytime. And also, there may be features in these social media applications to block people mm -hmm. who are bothering you. So you can take advantage of those features to block people who are bothering yep. you. Definitely. Um, the final topic before we get into questions and answers, and I realize we're probably going to run a, a few minutes over uh, the bottom of the hour, but um, is good citizenship. And maybe mm -hmm. Mrs. Lambert and Mr. Andrada, you know, what would you tell these scouts about being good citizens with their use of devices, data, networks, um, what, what kinds of things should they be keeping in mind to be good citizenship? Because remember, as part of the uh, Scouts BSA program, um, we are trying to be good citizens and we have a moral code um, that's different from just people in general. And so how can we live up to that moral code? Mrs. Lambert, do you wanna take that one first? Well, um... Uh, give you an example real quick if you want me to grab the, grab the yeah right, yeah let me think about that one again <laughs> so yeah, I mean, maybe one way to filter this is that you know there might be some of your classmates who pressure you into doing things like sharing pictures that really shouldn't be shared like don't be part of the problem and and keep sharing that information because you think it's funny or it's it's kind of mm -hmm. making fun of somebody else don't be a bully yourself right because that's well said. contrary to the scout open law but peter mr andrada yeah, I, I would say your reputation begins immediately. And you, you know, when I was um, your, your guys' age, there wasn't something like the mobile phones and the internet and that type of thing, such that I was my own person and I could recreate myself when I stepped up onto the, you know, onto the curb on University Avenue at the University of Minnesota. I could make myself brand new. I decided to do that. I had been, I mean, look at these glasses, guys, right? You know, this is classic nerd thickness glasses, right? But I decided to make myself an athlete at the university level, and I did that. Now, is that possible nowadays? Well, it's tough. If you have a, a history of, almost if you'd like to take a, one of those stamp stickers and you, and you stamp along a long line of paper, that's what's happening when you post things to social media and you leave little bits and traces of, maybe who you are really, or who you want to be online. There could be, you know, people misrepresent themselves all the time. So what I suggest with social media posts is that you keep it real and you be positive and you be strong. Now I'm gonna give you just a, if you give me just a little bit of rope here, Mr. Wu, I'm gonna weave a story here. Um, I was at McAfee for a long time. I mean, it's gonna sound crazy to you scouts, but I was there for 16 years at that one company, okay? So, um, and that's part of my 25 year career. But I would say that I met a vice president at the time. Now, we just happened to connect after he left and I left Mac, we connected. Now, my Facebook, it, I, I'm always me, I keep it real, right? Positive, energetic, What am I? what's my next run? What's my next hike, that kind of thing. Now that sounds kind of dull and maybe it is, but I mean, that's who I am. Now I will say that he went on to become the CFO and CEO of the company I'm at now. And one of the things he said to me is when I was looking for a job, he said, um, Hey, are you still looking? I said, yes, sir. I am. He goes, well, you know, I knew you at McAfee and I have to be honest, Peter, you're in any time I ever looked at your Facebook page, it was always the same message. I don't want to say that my Facebook persona or who I was online set me, got me this job at Jumio, but kind of, do you guys know what I'm saying? So my reputation online, I've cultivated and curated. Yeah, I'm on Twitter. I'm not going to share it with you guys, right? I'm on Facebook, but what I post there, I keep it real. I keep it me and I keep it positive. And it is, it is a reputation that I've built over the years. I, I don't know. Do you, you feeling that Mr. Wu? Do you know what I'm trying to yeah, say? Yeah, no. Uh... Um, nothing on the internet is ever forgotten because it's hard to get rid of stuff. And uh, your reputation, it's, it's something that you earn over time, but it can be lost in a second. Um, yeah. I, I was thinking, I was trying to think of the saying that I wanted to when you first asked me. 
what we used to always say when I worked at Citibank is don't put anything on social media that you don't want to see on the front page of the New York Times. Or an email for that matter. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because yeah, as you said, it's there forever. It's backed mm -hmm. up in a hundred different places that you don't even know about. Yep. And your reputation is one of the few things that you should have control over. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want somebody else to uh, besmirch or, or, you know. Uh, I mean, I can give you. I can give you easy, yep, I can give you an easy result, okay? Why I'm always telling the truth and I'm strong and I keep it positive and I keep it real. Here's why. One of the coolest things I ever have done in my 25 year career is I built a secured laptop for a former president of the United States. I don't say that to brag, scouts. What I'm saying is I would have never had that opportunity if I hadn't built a reputation through 16 years at McAfee and then onto Intel Security. I would have never had that opportunity and been selected out of hundreds of other professionals at the time that were available. They chose me. I was selected. I was chosen. You guys know what that feels like to be picked and chosen for something that's integral to you? If you live that integrity, if you live that truth and that strength, those are the type of opportunities that come up. Yeah, and I, I think that also underscores that um, in the information security profession, and I've had this experience too, sometimes some of the things that you do end up preventing problems that could have been national in scope. Like if you had messed that up, <laughs> Mr. Andrada, that could have been a disaster for our country. So we, we're touching these things that really make a lot of difference. I've had projects like that myself where I feel like I, I contributed to something that helped prevent big, big problems for our country and our world. So with that, um, you know, I, uh, what we're gonna do now is uh, just, we'll end with a reminder uh, before we start questions and answers that go back to your units to follow up on CyberChip so that you can get the CyberChip unit uh, award or CyberChip award from your senior scouts and, and or a, a scout master has to sign your CyberChip contract. So you're going to be following up after today with your uh, senior scouts and, and adult leaders. And uh, let's let's thank Mr. Andrada and Mrs. Lambert again. And thank you so much. Um, and we're going to turn off the recording.